good. Should we get started? All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Uh, welcome today to today's panel on recruiting tactics for a modern audience. Now, the overall discussion that we wanted to have here was uh, for user recruitment. And this is, of course, a key discipline in everything that we do. Proper user recruitment is key in not only acquiring accurate data, but appropriate data, making sure you have the appropriate audience for your games. Now, as we move, um, as the game industry evolves and continues to grow, we find that there's new challenges in re uh, recruiting the appropriate user for a, very, a variety of reasons. There's the usual suspects of you know, how, do, how do we find that person who might be interested in our game. But also, as games evolve, we have uh, new issues such as the continued hybridization of genres. If, you know, I'm not sure if genres have ever been really sort of concrete and distinct from each other, but as games continue to evolve and different genres borrow from different genres, we find it difficult to sort of isolate who's an RPG gamer or who's an action gamer. The broadening of gaming demographics as games spread more and more into the mobile space and other new avenues for gaming, we find that we're reaching new uh, audiences. And how do we get those users into our labs and into our tech? as well as the influx of small-sized digital downloads, not only in the mobile space, but even in the console space. So as we have more indie developers and more smaller, uh, smaller sized games come up, how do we find people who are interested in those games when the competitive titles have maybe only sold 40 to 50,000 units worldwide? So of course, all of these make it really difficult for us to reach our appropriate audiences, particularly when we're recruiting local. Um, and to that end, we have a panel of experts here, Carl Steiner, from, uh, who is the senior uh, researcher lead from Europe, Microsoft Studios. Uh, we have Nathan Cook, associate user researcher uh, from Electronic Arts. Stephen Schulmister, VP of Operations from BG Market. And I am Clay Borlick, senior user researcher here at the Experience Lab at FCUA. So uh, that being said, we're going to go ahead and take a moment to explain how each of our teams have dealt with the uh, issues of user recruitment. Uh, we can uh, start with me. Okay. Uh, so just a little more background on me. Ooh, that's loud. Um, I was previously at Disney Interactive where I was primarily in charge of uh, ops and recruiting. Uh, so I had two and a half years experience there before heading over to EA as a researcher. Um, and there, um, my primary role, role was to build up our recruiting program. There wasn't much there uh, when I started. So uh, it was more uh, dealing with basic problems. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today if, if you're kind of more in that space. Some of the basic problems that you can um, encounter and how to kind of overcome those. Um, of course, the overall goal of recruiting is to find a representative sample of your population, right? So uh, determining what those characteristics are of your sample po or of your population is absolutely crucial. Uh, so in essentially what your recruiting criteria are. Assessing what uh, those characteristics in possible candidates and whether or not they meet those criteria. Um, another very common problem, liars. We love liars. <laughs> People want that money, and they just want to say what they want to say to get in. So um, trying to deal with that. And of course, no shows and cancellations is always a common problem or a basic problem. Uh, some of the solutions that uh, in my two and a half years there at Disney we came up with um, was, again, careful analysis of the, being, the game being researched. What are the crucial components? What are the game mechanics that are crucial to this game? What kind of people enjoy those? What kinds of games? Uh, incorporate those as well that we can use for recruiting. And I know these guys are going to talk a little bit more detail about that. Um, the other one, screen, screen, and screen again. Just screen constantly. Um, we ended up developing an, a registration process with the database. So that was kind of an initial screening where we got basic information about people to help target our emails for certain populations. Uh, we would then send out an online survey or a screener that had more detailed questions uh, for a particular upcoming title or study. Uh, we would then do a complete phone screen of potential candidates as well. That was also to assess. Uh, articulation and further details. And then quite often we would do even an on-site screening. Uh, we developed a process of develop, uh, recruiting backups or uh, floaters, participants, uh, to help with the no-show and cancellation rates. And often, both would show up. Well, then we have two possible candidates. Let's pick the best of the two. Let's screen on site again and pick the best. Um, so that really helped out. And then, of course, even in tests, the researchers would ask some basic questions at the beginning of the study to kind of assess further. Uh, and um, uh, through that screening process, asking multiple questions to get at the same data points, asking it in different ways, also helps weed out liars. Um, we often, would a when asking about competitive titles, would throw in fake game names. Um, 
just to find those as well. Uh, so those are some of those. Uh, like I alluded to as well, recruiting backups helps. Um, compensating adequately also helps with no-shows um, and cancellations. Uh, we ended up going to a $75 per hour uh, rate, essentially, which is pretty standard in the Bay Area anyways at this point. So uh, building up that ro robust database as well is crucial. Spending the time and the effort and the money to find avenues to get people to get to your registration, to fill out that basic information, really trying to spend time with that. And using a pro uh, CRM or recruiting software to kind of streamline uh, uh, and uh, make that process more efficient was also really crucial for us. Um, so before we move on, I just I forgot to mention earlier that the way this is going to work is we're each going to introduce kind of our overall uh, tactics for dealing with this, and then we'll start the discussion between. But at any point, if anyone has any questions for any of the panelists, feel free to raise your hand, and uh, we will we can go ahead and um, ask uh, answer those. But once once we get past the first initial <laughs> introductions, but so well, well actually, and how am I doing on the volume? Going well. Okay. Um, yeah, I actually had a follow-up question, if I can sure. break our flow for a Talk second. <laughs> All right, so um, you mentioned compensating appropriately, <laughs> which is um, obviously important, I think. But do you have a sense for uh, a potential risk in overcompensating? Sure. So l let me set up a scenario. Okay. Um, when I started work with THQ, we were testing primarily in LA, and we had the same incentive scale that you did. We moved a lot of our test operation to Dallas, Texas. We were compensating at the same rate, mm. and we started having almost no no-shows, plus we were getting a lot more of the people who were actively trying to get into sessions, raising that risk of people misrepresenting their background. So we were able <laughs> to scale back, but I don't know if other people had similar experiences or thoughts about potential danger in being too generous in compensation. I actually um, feel really strongly about that. So uh, we, we found 75, and is this on? We found 75 an hour is actually um, a little high for us um, for a couple reasons. First of all, yes, you do get a lot of people coming out of the woodwork, especially the Craigslist kind of people that you get from Craigslist that say, Oh, seventy-five dollars an hour. Yeah, I'll play whatever you. I'll say I've played whatever you want. Um, and then when you ask them if they played something, the answer is yes. And then when you ask them what their favorite character is, they hang up on you. Um, <clears throat> what we found is we go. We like to go a little bit lower. Um, mainly because it saves us money, um, but also because you really get the right people. And if you advertise it as, you know, um, you're going to get to play an unreleased video game, and you're going to change the way the final version is made. The people who are actually excited about this stuff, who are usually the exact kind of people you're looking for, those are the people that are going to come out of the woodwork for a lower incentive. And we get a lot of people come in and say, we would do this for free. You know, this is a dream come true for us. This is, this is great. This is a great way to spend three hours of our day. And so for those of you who are not aware of what VG Market is, is Stephen actually here provides a bit of a unique perspective on this. He is actually uh, working for uh, a company that handles uh, recruitment and user testing as an external resource for companies. Uh, we actually work very close with them here in uh, SCA as well. Yeah. Should I just do my... Oh, sure, just might as well continue. Sorry, yeah. did you want to? <laughs> well, I, w I was just going to add to that. Uh, agreed. Uh, it's a very fine and careful balance, and you have to kind of play with it and experiment with it for you and the area you're in. Um, also, if you have a very strong fan base, then yeah, you can probably get in people in for cheaper and or free. Um, so it, you do definitely have to play around with that. That's kind of what we ended up settling on at Disney Interactive, but that was, again, customized kind of for our needs at the time. Sure. Uh, and yeah, for more mainstream stuff, especially mobile games, you can't always sell it like that. Uh, you can still sell it as, hey, you're going to be playing a bunch of games. But, uh, you know, depending, of course, on the, the spec, you know, if it's parents, you might need to pay a little bit more. Um, my name is Steven. I work for a company called VG Market. We do market research for the video game industry. Um, we work with Sony all the time, EA, pretty much everyone. Um, one thing uh, Nathan, uh, Nathan mentioned that I want to riff on a little bit is liars. Um, this is a big problem. Even with low incentive, you get a lot of people who um, are generally interested in doing playtests but maybe don't necessarily qualify for yours. And so they, everyone tries to become a jack of all trades. And so you really need to 
vet people is um, what Nathan said, and I, and I agree with that 100%. Um, the way we do that is um, if you've ever used an external recruiter, um, if they're a standard market research company, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll have little old ladies on their phones saying, oh, have you played this game? Have you played this game? Have you played this game? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great, you're in. Um, at VG Market, we have a call center of gamers, um, and we have a, a training process where they know how to, if there's a game they haven't played, research a game, figure out what questions they can ask about the game that won't make the respondent feel like they're being interrogated, but at the same time will tell you without, without any doubt whether or not they've played the game, and beyond that, whether or not they can express themselves about their opinions of a game. Um, on top of that, like you said, the on-site rescreen. Um, when I'm a moderator for a group, I like to go out and meet the respondents when they first come in, and I won't dress like this. I'll go out wearing a League of Legends shirt or something else, or a Mario shirt, or something that a lot of gamers can relate to, and they won't even realize that I'm the moderator, and they'll talk to me like, you know, they'll open up to me, and they'll tell me, oh, like, these are the games I'm playing, and I can get them to express themselves about the games they're playing. So then when they get into the group, they're much more engaged, and they feel like they can talk to you instead of just some random guy in a suit. Um, and the last thing I wanted to touch on before I go on is um, the importance of, uh, and, and the guys at Sony are going to hate me for this, um, getting out of the Bay Area, getting out of your headquarters, and testing in different areas. And there's two main reasons for that. One is if you're testing in your fancy Sony lab, which is amazing, <laughs> as you'll, most of you will probably see later, um, there's definitely a bias, especially if someone's a Sony fanboy, which is usually who you're recruiting. Um, they will be protective of their feedback because they don't want, they know you're Sony, they don't, wanna, they don't want to um, insult you and they don't want, to, they, they'll think that you might not invite them back if they give bad feedback. Even if you tell them at the beginning, we want bad feedback, we want good feedback, we want it all. Um, there's a bias that you just can't get rid of at your own facility. Um, the other thing is that this is going to sound really arrogant and it's gonna sound like a perception thing, but it's absolutely true. People in the Bay Area are better with technology. They're better with user interface. And if you're testing in Indianapolis or the Corn Belt or Kansas City uh, or you know pretty much anywhere else, people aren't going to, going to get it as fast as people in the Bay Area. And in, and in addition to that, there's a lot of uh, difference of opinion in different uh, geographic regions throughout the country and throughout the world. So. Um, a, a big game like, I don't know, Bioshock, just to name one that was in here last session, uh, a, big, a game with a big budget like that, I would definitely say test in multiple cities, test in multiple countries, and really find out what the, the, the average market is going to think about your game, not just people in the Bay Area. So actually, going off of something you said earlier, and I'll, I'll come back to that point then. I've got a mic. <laughs> um, is, you know, we try not to just recruit fanboys of of our games. Now, I think uh, recruiting to that core audience is extremely important, particularly if you're dealing with a franchise. And you know, we do we use pretty standard uh, recruiting tactics here at Sony as well. But oftentimes, you want to find the, that sort of fringe user, the user that might that should be interested in your game, but for whatever reason hasn't par uh, purchased anything in that franchise before. And that's really where we've started to kind of spend our energy um, to try and figure out well, why is it these users um, are interested in these kinds of games? are not interested in these kinds of games. And to that end, we, we're just in the infancy, but we've, discussed, we've uh, started working on something that we're calling the game DNA system. Now we've sat down and we've decided to uh, analyze games as a whole to see how games can meaningfully differentiate each other and create these little, almost like game uh, genes that we can tag games with. So if someone, you know, let's say we're working on Bioshock to use an example earlier, not that someone would be working on Bioshock, but, um, are people playing it because it's kind of RPG-like? Are they playing it because it's uh, survival horror-like? Are they playing it because it's an FPS? That answer is going to be different depending on which user you ask. So how do you find those users who haven't played Bioshock yet but are interested in those various elements? And our answer to that, now of course we haven't done the full experimentation yet, so we don't have an answer whether or not this actually work, is to see, well, maybe this person has played other games with similar DNA. And we would then go ahead and uh, analyze their play history and try and find a match that way. 
who are also kind of taking the opposite approach of asking people uh, know what games they play and then seeing if there's any patterns that emerge. But that's sort of the, one of the new tactics that we're using to approach uh, trying to find those, those fringe uh, p participants. And I, I kind of go off of that too. That was something we started kind of looking at Disney as well. Mm -hmm. um, we were kind of going based on genres um, and trying to describe genres. Uh, most of Disney's yeah. play testers, so to speak, were more of the casual market. Mm -hmm. So they weren't necessarily hardcore gamers who really understood what genres were or what the various genres were. So we had to get into kind of describing um, genres and the specific game mechanics that were involved in that to try to help people understand, oh yeah, I play this kind of game. Um, so I think that's really key, and especially when, when yeah, what you guys are trying to do with um, looking at more of the niche, kind of smaller, um, it's really helpful in that regard as well. Especially, again, if you're looking at casual games, people are not necessarily going to know what a first-person shooter is if it's a 45-year-old mom playing Candy Crush. Like, so, uh, yeah, you have to kind of describe that to them, and breaking that down, I think, is very, very helpful. All right, and one other perspective, as long as we're talking about getting sort of specialized candidates in. Uh, so I'm Carl Steiner. Uh, I previously had worked at THQ Games. I now work at Microsoft. And a situation that's come up for us, well, just to set some background, we do a lot of database recruiting similar to uh, the, the methods that were described here. It's a great way of getting uh, a general audience of gamers in to get feedback from this, this broad representative pool of users. But for some test circumstances, we want a very specific profile of users. So at THQ Games, for instance, one of their bigger franchises was a sports game, and they had year after year releases. So it was important to bring new people into the game, um, but it was also important not to alienate the super users, the fans, the people who bought the game year after year and understood down to the sub-second when they had to click to, uh, to pull off certain moves in the game. And at one point, the producers were looking at updating the game engine. It was going to increase the graphic quality of the game. That's a good thing. It was going to make the controls more responsive. That's a good thing. But it was going to change the feel. And so when we tested with the people that came in through our database, um, sports game fans, uh, people who like that particular title, we were getting good feedback, but we realized we weren't getting enough of those super fans. So we had to find a way to get more of those people into our lab. And the solution we came up with was to get more of those people specifically into our database. Uh, we went out to some of the social media sites that the super fans tended to visit. We went to the uh, game website. We went to events and we distributed invitations for these people to register in our database. So as a result of that, we had thousands of new people coming into our database. We had added fields in the database to identify how did you hear about this opportunity. We looked at the time that they registered. We looked at that flag. We were able to see these are probable super fans. And so that um, gave us a step forward in our screening. So the technique worked well. Downsides, I guess, took a fair amount of additional time and effort. Um, and there's a risk of self-selection with any of these things if we're paying less because there are certain people who are motivated to come in and give feedback on a game. It was even more pronounced with these super fans. They're very invested. Um, but in this case, that was fine because those were exactly the people and the type of feedback that we wanted. So actually, it looks like we're, uh, this went by really, really quickly. Uh, <laughs> coming in on, closing in on uh, almost five minutes left. So if you want to... Maybe, maybe ask some questions. I know you had a, you were the first one with a question earlier. Um, I'm just wondering what CRM system you guys oh, are using. Oh. Um, good question. Um, we actually went with a software suite called Thinkster that was actually not so much a CRM, but more of a full suite recruiting tool. Uh, it was a database. It was a survey engine. It was an email client. It's automatically sent reminders. Um, it was very interesting. Um, there was another one we were researching near my, the end of my time there um, that was even better um, by the name of ARCS. Um, and uh, they, that was looking really uh, good. We we're hoping to switch to that. Um, but yeah, there are a couple of small niche software companies out there that are making s software specifically for this kind of thing. Another question? Uh, so you 
you mentioned uh, you had a DNA system for, for games. So right. You mentioned Bioshock and Bioshock RPG and Shooter and, and War. So what's a game which matches those? Um, I don't have the database memorized. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, but, well, but how is the determination being made? Is it like, oh, you know, like here are other games which have RPG, or is it here are other well, games which have so, all those things? So RPG in its, in a, in a, of itself is a genre. Sure. And so what we actually sat down and did was we deconstructed what RPG means. And we've gone down and broken it down to, is, does that, you know, stuff like uh, stat-based progression versus player skill-based progression. Um, we've broken down basically camera angle, uh, anything from the actual setting that's being used to even the business model. So we're trying to, I use that as a shorthand, but we're trying to avoid kind of these genre staples sure. and we're trying to break it down to its core components. And some games have a list of 30 to 40 DNA tags attached to them and it's nowhere near comprehensive at this point. But we're hoping that we'd be able to then sit down with a team when they're making a new game and say, okay, what are your, the key components of this game that you really want people to enjoy? And then using those to identify what DNA tags the new game has. And then we, get, we like to get to a point where we can then just drop that in the database and have it pull up a, uh, a uh, list of matches. So would you go for games which have a subset of those tags or all of those tags? Um, it depends on the needs. So sometimes you might have a really unique game that might not have a one-to-one -one comparison with other genres. So you find what the closest things are. Um, for example, uh, we were recently testing a game that I can't name, um, but it was a very, a fairly unique kind of, uh, had a unique appeal to it, um, and it was part of a series, but we wanted to find users that had never played that series before. But the problem is, is that it was such an iconic game in its, within its own little subgenre that we found it really difficult to then branch out beyond that. And that was, so we started looking at games that we felt were close enough that they, we feel like the, the bridge would be easy to, to, uh, to cross. And the other kind of issue with that was that really relied on someone on the team having an extensive knowledge of the breadth of games that are out there. So when, you, when you're dealing with a large user, a user research team, if you don't have someone like that on your, on your team, or if that person leaves or whatever, you're left with this kind of gap in knowledge. And we're hoping that database can then be used for someone who's new to the team to be able to just plug in a few tags, and then it, boom, you pull up a whole list of, of comparative games. Uh, if you have a hand up. Um, so you talked about using people from a database. How do you get people into that database? Mm, good question. <laughs> I think you kind of alluded to it. I, I, at Disney, that was also part of what we did. Um, using whatever internal tools you can f that are free, of course, is best. Uh, Disney, being Disney, had a list of millions upon millions of people throughout the United States that we were able to tap into. That really helped. Um, but also, at one point, we started shifting our focus towards kind of what we called mid-core games for mobile devices. Um, so we were, that, suddenly our database of 45-year-old mothers wasn't really quite adequate. Um, so we had to get creative, um, kind of like what you did. We, we were looking at Marvel titles, since Disney now owns Marvel. and. Um, Going to comic book stores, game stores, um, was one thing we started to do, that, and kind of working through them, um, collaborating with them on how to connect with their, their customer base. Uh, that really helped us a lot. Um, yeah, that, th those are, uh, we, we did a lot of things with trying Facebook ads, Google ads, things like that, which weren't so successful for us, unfortunately. Um, but you just have to really get creative, trial and error kind of thing. Depends on, you know, again, what kind of um, users you're trying to find and fill your database with. Is that? Yeah. How do you get those kind of people? Uh, well, a lot of them are just in our database. Our database, um, <clears throat> to kind of riff off the last question, has grown in just so many different ways because we've existed for almost 10 years at this point. Um, I mean, we just have a ton of people, and so most of them are console gamers, but a lot of those console gamers are also mobile gamers. Um, and so, I mean, really, that's, that's a tough question. Um, but for us, it's just a matter of we've got so many people, and at this point, we're we're kind of viral. Like, um, you know, our Facebook page. Uh, whenever we um, have a new playtest that we have, we we blast it on our Facebook page, so that gets posted to all the friends of people of our fans. So a lot of those are non-gamers who play mobile games, and so we can reach them that way. I think we have time for one more question. In the back. I'm curious, so apart from weeding out the liars, uh, what uh, indicators do you guys hit upon you know, this year that you might target market? I, I imagine that it's been a 
half the screeners are still guards and, and really kind of superstars as far as representatives of democracy going for. I'm curious to hear from you guys, what are the indicators of lights that are you know, going off in your head, like this is has struck gold here? For, for me, when I hear struck gold, I think of people who give great feedback, not necessarily people who are going to buy your game, but people who can you know, participate in a play test and give great feedback and say, this is what I like about it and this is what I don't like about it. And, and, and some of the best respondents are the ones who can articulate, here's why I would not buy this game. And that's some of the best actionable feedback. We're almost out of time, so did you guys want to? Actually, I do have one, one comment on that. Um, so one thing we try to avoid is trying to find people that, oh, that guy is really good because he's, he's playing this game the way we want. Sometimes if they match the criteria and they've, you know, they, they've passed all the screeners and they come in and they're still kind of a dud, chances are they probably would have still bought that game um, in the market and they would have had that same experience. So we actually use that as, a, as another point of valid feedback. We've had people come in um, who have just completely been horrible at the game, but at the end of the day, they actually loved it because chances are that's their experience that they have at home. Maybe they're just not good at games, but they still, have, they still like that experience. So as long as, as long as we're confident in our recru recruitment criteria, I think it doesn't really matter how they end up performing in the actual test itself. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Frowny face. Should be a frowny face on that.